In this screencast, I'm going to explain the content that we covered in the week 28 class. So first, we started getting ready for our Oaks Park amusement Oaks Park Amusement Park trip by collecting some personal data, and you can just do this next week when you get to class. Then we did a little review of refraction, what we studied last week in Snell's Law. So this is a picture of my daughter in a shallow swimming pool, and you can see that because of the way the light rays from her feet are bending when they come out of the water, um, our brain kind of, you know, mentally extends those light rays back and thinks that her feet were higher up than they were, which makes her legs look shorter. So just like the appearing dot activity that we did, and here's just a real life example of that. Then we just talked a little bit more about fiber optics. Uh, this is a picture here of a fiber optic cable. And right here, we looked at in class, this is a photo of it. Um, this is a piece of jello that's about a centimeter wide. And this is a laser. So we're shining the laser light into the end of the jello, and it's behaving just like a fiber optic cable. So you can see it's having total internal reflection inside the jello. Then we got into the meat of our class, which was about thin converging lenses. And these are the three major points that are on the note. So point A, B, and C, um, take a look at those, and then let's get going on point A. So point A says, if light rays enter a lens parallel to the principal axis, what directions do they travel when they come out? So here's the principal axis that we always draw as a horizontal line going through the center of the lens. And then here's the lens. And you did this in the homework. And you use Snell's law to predict, due to refraction, what direction the light ray would travel inside the lens and then when it came out. And hopefully you saw that they should intersect at a point um, as predicted by Snell's law. So here's a simplified diagram of that. We have the principal axis. We have three incoming light rays that are parallel to the principal axis. And then we have our lens just simplified here in the drawing, drawing as a vertical line. And here they, we're predicting an intersection at one point. So what we wanted to do in class was to test the prediction. So we used the light box with three slits, um, a lens that could sit flat on the paper, a paper template, and a ruler. And I will show you now what that looked like. Then what we did was we turned the light box around, we shone the light rays in from the other side, and we found that on the other side it's symmetric. There's also another place where all the light rays intersect. The special point is called the focal point. Every light ray that enters a lens parallel to the principal axis will exit the lens and pass through this point. So note that down. And then the focal length is the distance from the center of the lens to the focal point. And we measured on that paper and found that the focal length was the same on both sides of the lens. Point A4, how can we find the focal length of a convex lens? How can we find this point? So what we need is some light rays that are parallel to the principal axis. If we have several light rays parallel to the principal axis, and we can see where they converge, then we know that's the focal point. So one strategy is to use light from the sun, which we actually could not do in class this week because it was cloudy, but you've done this maybe with a magnifying glass. Um, if you were to have your converging lens really close to the sun, you can see that the light rays that would go through it would not be parallel to each other or to the principal axis. But where we are, very far from the sun, you can see that the light rays from the sun that would actually be able to go through the lens would have to be very nearly parallel to each other. So when you use the sun and you put a converging lens there and you get that really bright spot on a piece of paper, that distance from the bright spot to the lens, that is the focal length. So that bright spot is occurring at the focal point. So we couldn't do that, but we did another method. Um, 
I don't have a slide for it. So the second method that we did was called uh, the distant object method here in the data table. And this, for this, we just opened the front door to let in bright, the bright scene from outside, so the house across the street. Inside the house, we had it pretty dim and dark. And then you hold the lens um, over by the kitchen area and then hold an index card behind the lens and you can actually get an image of the view outside the front door on that index card, kind of like the pinhole camera. Um, and I can show you this at the next class in person. Um, so it turns out that the house across the street is distant enough that the light rays that get through the lens are parallel enough that you get a really quite accurate result for the focal length doing that method. So we had three lenses, and I'll put a picture of the lenses just so you can see what they look like. Um, they have different shapes, so basically made with different circular curvatures. If you think about that um, diagram you traced in the homework last week, they have different curvatures, so they have different focal lengths. Um, and I just color coded the lenses. So we had what we called, they just had a, a colored dot on them. So the green lens, the red lens, and the blue lens, but they were all clear glass. And these were the focal lengths that we got. So green, 20 centimeters, red, 15 centimeters, and blue, 25 centimeters. And remember, focal length, this is measured from the lens. So in summary, Light rays that approach a converging lens parallel to the principal axis will intersect at the focal point after leaving the lens. And there is a focal point on both sides of the lens at the same distance from the lens. So there's a symmetry. And the last point, the focal point for a lens can be found by sending in light rays that are parallel to the principal axis and observing where they intersect. Point B. For different object locations, what are the locations and characteristics of the images? What we want to do now is actually use the lens to form images. This is a candle and we're going to use the candle for our object. And this is a side view of a lens. This is the principal axis. I've marked the focal point on both sides. Notice the symmetry. And I've also marked this point that is a distance of two times the focal length. This turns out to be a really important place also. So I marked F and 2F on both sides. And in this experiment, what we did was we actually um, placed the candle in these different regions. And the reason these regions are important is because each region produces images with distinct characteristics. So anytime the candle is farther away than 2F, the image will have a certain set of characteristics. Certain things will be true of the image that's formed. When the candle is at 2F, there will be certain characteristics that are true. When the candle is in this range between F and 2F, there will be certain characteristics of the images. And when the candle is closer than F, so in this very first region here, there will be certain characteristics. You might notice what I left out. I didn't talk about what happens if you put the candle at F, and that's because something very interesting happens if you put it there, and we will talk about that next week. So we went to the lab and we set it up, and I will include a photo of what we saw. And I've put in your chart already the data, just some sample data that you can use for the analysis that you'll do in the homework this week. And what you should see there from the data is that whenever the, um, whenever the object is farther away than the focal point, so back there <laughs> to the left of that focal point, the little image of the candle that we saw in the index card, it was upside down. But the size depended so on where it was. So if it was farther than 2F, it was the little image of the candle flame on the card was smaller than the original actual candle flame. 
at 2f, if the object was at 2f, then the image of the candle flame that we saw in the card, it was the same size as the actual candle flame. And if we had the candle uh, between f and 2f, then the image, the size of the image, was larger, um, but it was still inverted. And all of these were real images so far. The first three are all real. And the reason we know they're real is because a real image is formed by an intersection of real light rays. And we know that light rays are actually, real light rays are actually going through the lens and they're actually intersecting over here somewhere, which is where we're getting that image on the card. Um, when we worked with mirrors, flat mirrors called plane mirrors, um, those images were virtual images because the light, the real light rays are hitting the mirror and they're reflecting off and it's your brain that is, you know, kind of extrapolating and imagining this intersection behind the mirror. There are not actual light rays intersecting behind the mirror to make that image. That's why images formed by, you know, the kind of mirrors we have in our bathrooms, those are virtual images. For this last one, we couldn't find um, an image on an index card. So no matter where we put the card, we couldn't find an image. So what was going on here? Well, maybe there weren't real light, light rays intersecting. Maybe the light rays were diverging on the other side of the lens. Well, if the light rays are diverging, hmm, maybe if I put my eye there so the light rays could get into my eye, my brain would imagine an intersection. And that's what happens if you get down and um, if you put your eye over here on the right side of this diagram and you look towards the lens, there's diverging light rays coming out and then your brain works backwards, sort of like with the mirror, and imagines an intersection point and sees this larger upright image of the candle. So that's a virtual image because not formed by the intersection of real light rays. Okay, this right here is just the instructions for when we set up the lab. This, we, drew, we drew this out on a long paper as you saw in the photo. Part C, we wanna look at how do these images form? So what direction are the light rays traveling as they leave the object and go towards the lens? And then what directions are they traveling when they come out? How can we understand what the individual light rays are doing? So in C1, we did a lab activity looking at what are the paths of different light rays from one point on the object after they go through the lens. So this might remind you a little bit of the pinhole camera. Remember the pinhole camera, we looked at uh, several light rays that reflected off the top of the person's head, and then we traced what direction were they going, you know, when they went through the hole, and where did they hit the screen. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use uh, the light box to look at one light ray at a time. So we did this on a flat piece of paper, and I will put a photo of this so that you can see it. The photo you're seeing is after the activity was done and all the light rays have been traced. So initially we didn't have any light rays on the right hand side. After we were done, all the light rays had been drawn. but I'll also show you individual pictures of the main three light rays that we were interested in. So first what we did was set up the light box to shine in a single light ray along the arrow that's labeled one. So light ray number one. And in the photo you can see which direction it comes out. And we notice that it comes out going through the focal point. Then we did light ray two and we notice if we shine the light ray in this direction, it kind of looks like it just keeps going straight. Light ray number three, notice light ray number three comes in through the first focal point. And when it came out, it looked parallel to the principal axis. and we had an intersection point over here. Then we used the light box to also trace the other two light rays, and we found that all of the light rays that originated at the single point on the candle intersected at this single point over here. 
And you notice these are real light rays that are intersecting. So if we put a screen there, you would be able to see the image because those light rays will bounce off the screen and get to your eyes. You cannot see the image, an image from your bathroom mirror, you cannot put that on a screen because there are no actual light rays intersecting at a point to bounce off to get to your eyes. So that might help. So question C2, what light rays have paths that can be easily predicted using landmarks? So we wanna draw ray diagrams to show how images are formed. And if we could predict how path, how light rays are gonna travel without getting out the light box and actually you know, tracing them, that would be really useful. So here are the three, what I call the three easy rays. So light ray number one, and write these down, a light ray that comes in parallel to the principal axis will go out passing through the focal point. So just pause the video as you need to on these next couple slides to get these down. Light ray number two, a light ray that comes in at the center of the lens will continue in a straight line. Light ray three, a light ray that comes in in line with the focal point will go out parallel to the principal axis. The reason for this wording here, you'll see when we draw our ray diagrams next, why I said it that way. Sometimes it actually passes through it. Other times it's just in line with it. So that will make more sense a little bit later. But notice it came in through the focal point or in line with the focal point, And then after it went through the lens, it was traveling parallel to the principal axis. But remember, there are millions of light rays that go through the lens uh, from any given point on the object. These three are just the easy ones to predict their direction. C3, how do the paths of the light rays explain the image locations and characteristics? So for this, you'll need the other handout that has graph paper on it, and we will draw the ray diagrams. <laughs> 